Hello everybody, uh, Michel Grossetti. Uh, we're going to take turns with this presentation. Claire will follow me and Alain will conclude. First of all, we would like to thank INSNA for awarding us this prize, which is a great honor for us. We are particularly proud to be innovative on several levels. Uh, indeed, we are the first triad uh, to be awarded this prize. We are also the first to make our presentation on video. Finally, we would like to point out that we have respected what the media calls social distancing. Of course, every network analyst knows that this is physical distance that has little to do with social distance. Anyway, as you can see, during the preparation of this presentation, we did respect the distances recommended by the health authorities. All three of us have worked on a variety of topics, many of which obviously relate to networks. We are going to focus on what, we've, what we are doing together. We share a number of questions. How are interpersonal relationships formed? We all know that they are built during interaction in social context. But how do we move from these meetings, exchanges to something more lasting? How does this relationship disappear? Relationships are more durable than interactions, but they can weaken and disappear. How does this happen? How do relationships aggregate to form networks? New relationships are not independent of those in which the people involved are already engaged. How do networks reconfigure with the arrival of new relationships? or the breakdown of existing ones. What is the link between interpersonal relationships and people's social situations? Can we see the relationships and the networks they constitute as a source of information about people's situations? For example, what are the collective contexts in which people live, families, work situations, associative or political activities, and so on? Does the composition and structure of the networks Tell us whether people are in a couple or not, whether they are sedentary or mobile, whether they are in a more privileged or more popular social status. What does the composition and structure tell us about their background? For example, that they have experienced many biographical changes. Do relationships increase social inequalities? Relationships can cross the boundaries of organizations, social classes, communities, but they also often tend to be homophilic for gender, age, level of education, etc. Are network a counterweight to inequality stemming from social origin and educational background, or on the contrary, do they increase them? Our hypothesis is that interpersonal relations are an intermediate level between that of individuals and that of wider context, in particular social classes, communities, etc. We are merely taking up an old idea here, since the title of the first French conference on networks organized by Alexis Ferrand in 1987 was An Intermediate Level Social Networks. Before presenting some results and ideas on these issues, we would like to point out some major influences on our work. There are many others, of course, but these are the ones we felt were the most significant. You will recognize some ancestors. Zimmel, Bouglé, who was a French sociologist whom Zimmel inspired a lot, some researchers at the frontiers of mathematics, and network analysts who do not need to be introduced here. And like all researchers, we work in a network. We will not name all the people who are on this slide, but we would like to thank them warmly. It's a small part of our triad personal networks. We haven't done the exercise of identifying the links between the halters, calculating density or centralities, but it is certain that our work is strongly embedded in this network. Let's now turn to the question we are interested in. As consensus researchers, we have developed 
hypothesis based, of course, on our reading of the work of the researchers who inspired us. As we've seen, relationships do not arise by chance. There are social contexts that frame interactions and the formation of interpersonal relationships. Socio-historical contexts influence personal networks. Differences in context can produce and reinforce social inequalities. Contexts vary along life courses. For individuals, some contexts appear at a certain period of their lives, others disappear. One can think of studies, jobs, associative commitments, etc. A personal network observes that a given time is, in part, a recording of episodes experienced during the life course. From this point of view, it is somewhat analogous to an archaeological site. Relationships and networks influence life courses. Our sources are mainly personal network studies conducted in France. One of them is a study carried out in Caen on young people using an original, very precise and longitudinal method. Another source is a survey carried out in Toulouse in 2001 on a population of all ages using the method developed by Claude Fisher in California in the 1970s. We also used more recent studies adapting the Fisher method and national survey from France and other countries. We try also to compare our results as much as possible to those of other teams in other countries and we are also engaged in collaborations that contribute to broaden our perspective beyond the French framework. Relationships and networks take place in social contexts. We can differentiate between very macro contexts, large social equilibria and processes, and meso context of relationship creation. Personal networks are influenced by macro social contexts. This context includes broad balances of social class, gender, generation, community, etc. Depending on the state of these balances, certain relationships are more likely, easier to establish, or on the contrary, unlikely. There are also socio-political contexts. For example, in an authoritarian context, or where legal institutions are not very effective, weak ties can be dangerous or unreliable. Also, they are very, a very important resource. Finally, there are historical contexts. You don't need to be told that relationships are not created in periods of lockdown in the same way as in other periods, or that times of great political change disrupt activities and thus personal relationships. Okay. One of the evolutions of contemporary worlds concerns communication technologies. Relationships are increasingly equipped with communication technologies to the point that the term social network is for younger people synonymous with online social networking devices. The graph shows the proportion of alters who are also friends on Facebook, according to the Age of Ego in 2017 survey of more than 700 people in the Toulouse region. This equipment has little effect on the characteristic of personal networks like size, composition, density, etc. But above all, it makes relationships more explicit and encourages the reflexivity of people on their network. Networks have a bright side. The social links that allow people to live together, to help each other, to access resources. It also has a dark side. Firstly, networks are unequal. People with a high level of education, social status or high income have on average more relationships and more diversified relationships. Second, the tendency towards homophily in terms of education, social status or income can be interpreted as soft segregation, tendency towards social homogeneity of social environment, a fragmentation of the social world. Work in progress seems to indicate that in countries such as France, this fragmentation is increasing. 
Speaking of historical context, Claire and I have engaged with 10 other researchers in an online survey of social life during lockdown in France. We used general questions on sociability and a name generator with five alters maximum on the people whose respondents got close to each other during the lockdown. We obtained more than 16,000 complete questionnaires. The first analysis of this data show that most of the respondents turned to their family and close friends as a priority, and also to weaker but socially homophilic ties. Women are the most active in maintaining all types of ties, family, neighbors, friends, etc. Young people were particularly affected by the situation. They are the most numerous to say that they have lost sight of friends, seeing some relationships deteriorate, but also that they have created others online. We will continue this research to see if it's this temporary situation has led to more lasting changes in, for some persons. Socio-historical context influences the characteristic of personal networks. But for a given method, this varies to a sufficiently limited extent that comparisons can be made. In 2001, I transposed the method developed by Claude Fischer to France, and the result proved to be comparable. The main differences was the smaller proportion of very narrow networks in France, and their slightly more local character in geographical terms. Macrosocial context color networks, favoring or discouraging the establishment of certain links but their effects are mediated by more local context in which interpersonal links are formed and evolve. First, they are relatively stabilized collective, such as families, for example. Even I'm not sure that we have taken the best example of stability in the illustration. Being part of a collective implies exchanges with other members, sometimes formal, formal relationships. The network is itself a context, due among other things to the well-known process of closing the triangle, someone introduces you to someone. There are also temporary gatherings around common issues, such as a conference, for example. And there are also contingent co-presences in places or social events. To explain this last category, we can use an old example proposed more than a century ago by the sociologist Celestin Bouglet. In this example, travelers take a stagecoach. They are simply neighbors in the car. Perhaps they can exchange polite words. It is not impossible that some people discover affinities, but it is not the most common case. However, the situation is very different when the stagecoach is attacked. In this case, the passengers are faced with a common threat. They share their anxiety or their determination. It gives a driving force. They form a temporary collective that can lead to the emergence of relationships. We have not included the stagecoach under attack in our investigations, but we can give an idea of how these different contexts appear in the contemporary period when respondents are asked about the context in which are encountered the cited actors. We can see that if we include the family, collectives constitute more than half of the cases. The identification of networks about a third, and there, there is little room left for other situations. Thank you very much for your attention. And I let Claire continue now. As everybody can guess, I am Claire. Having established this prim primacy of context over the birth of relationships, the question that guided our joint research was how, then, do relationships emerge from these contexts? How do they constitute networks? What are these dynamics? There are different kinds of dynamics on different scales, sequences, and combinations. Different units can evolve. Ego, alters sighted, their relationships, the whole network, and their characteristics, 
For example, an individual can change his job or marital situation. A relationship can change in strength, in spatial distance, and so on. And the network can change in density or modularity and so on. And some characteristics of networks are also linked with characteristics of relationships that constitute them. We are centrally interested in the articulations between changes in the personal network and changes in the life course. Even in their evolution, relationships are very much a matter of context. Indeed, the most common way to strengthen a relationship is to add a new context to the original one in which ego and alter first met. Like, for example, when co-workers go for outing for the first time. It increases the polyvalence of the tie and it decreases its dependency on the first context. Then the tie becomes more adaptable and resilient even when the context changes or disappears, like for school friends, for instance. Other additional contexts make the tie even stronger, multiplex, flexible and long-lasting. The relationship decouples from contextuality itself. Contexts become less relevant. An event or an incident in the original context may replace or accelerate this process as it changes roles and expectations, giving a more dyadic dimension to the tie. The driving force of the tie moves from context and activities to the dyadic di dimension. Because it was he, because it was me, like uh, Montaigne said about, about his friend La Boissy. Then the elected person can be presented to the spouse and to other friends. This is the most common way for young adults to build relationships and networks. In a longitudinal survey like the Campanel, the same procedure of name generator is duplicated at each survey wave. Thus, some new names appear and others disappear when they are no more cited. This is more reliable than memory which is especially uncertain and distorting about lost relationships. At each wave of the survey, therefore, the personal network is first reconstructed using the same procedure. Then, the investigator returns to his office and compares it with the list of names cited in the previous wave. He then, or she then, comes back and submits to the respondent the list of names cited in the previous wave and not cited in the current wave. Then it becomes possible to ask for each name why this person is no longer cited. Any omissions can therefore still be corrected. Thus, at each wave of the survey corresponds a network we may compare in terms of size, composition and structure. And we can identify correspondences with life events and coincidence between biographical and rela relational process. Then we can examine, for example, when a conjugal event occurs, which alters were no more cited at this wave and which are new ones. Moreover, the fact that it is done both by systematic collection of relationships and by long interviews allows for back and forth analysis between methods. It is thus possible to start from the interviews and code the lost ties in the alter files. We can see that the loss of ties is also essentially a matter of context. Conversely, we can first identify trends in the datasets. For example, here, the tendency of networks to become more centralized along the process of partnering between the centralization of the network is higher when partners meet and form a couple. The partner is the one who concentrates the most shortest path to all other alters. To better understand this process, we can think in terms of sequences. How does the between the centralization of networks evolve between survey waves? We therefore measure the evolution at each interval between two survey waves and see whether conjugal transitions 
occurred at the same time. Centralization occurs mostly when partners form a couple. We then sorted the data by this difference in order to identify the egos who experienced the maximum increase of centralization. And the winner is Samuel, in the sequence in which he met a partner. Then we draw the graphs of Samuel's network before and after this event, and we can check the evolution in the structure of his network. When Emmanuel, his partner, here in pink, of course, appeared in his life. We can also identify alters who are connected to her and those who are not, and try to know more about them. Are they, for example, in the same conjugal situation? Do they live far away? Does Samuel know them for a long time or not? We have all these variables in the alter files. Then we want to better understand this process of centralization on the partner. Did Samuel introduce Emmanuel to his friends? Did he leave his own friends and adopt those of Emmanuel or any other way of centralizing? Then we go to the interview of Samuel and we learn that he had, in fact, to abandon his friends who no longer suited his new situation of having a partner, and that he made new friends with Emmanuel at the same time. He largely renewed his network with common friends who better correspond to his new conjugal situation. This can give us the idea to make other quantitative analysis. For example, here, on the duration of the ties with alters compared to the duration of the partnership, and so on. Then, with these switches between datasets and methods, we can tell stories, compare them, find trends and explain them, find common patterns and variations, and so on. Then we found that there are different ways to centralize networks. Let us observe three networks that are all centralized on the par partner. They would be classified as quite structurally similar, with several components centralized on the partner only. But they do not come from the same previous shape. One was formerly segmented in components, the other one was dense, the last one was more chain-stretched. Then, the temporal dimension allows for a better understanding of the present. There, these are real differences that we wouldn't have seen without the longitudinal dimension, and they show different processes. A convergence of formally separated components around the partner, or a progressive dissociation and specialization by context with the only partner crossing them, or an integration of the partner with individuals and, coupling, and couples by introducing him or her. This shows not only the value of studying changes in networks, but also of seeing how the analysis of these changes help us to better understand the diversity of biographical processes, in this case, the integration of the partner in the network. Let us see a whole network story now. Veren is in couple with Gael, and they began in a group of friends in the same village in 1995. And we see all the band and relatives sharing scout activities, sports, cafe, and so on. Then Veren in wave two started to work and her network became increasingly specialized by contexts and Gael became more and more central. In the third wave, they settled together. The network decreased in size in a typical dyadic withdrawal process. In the fourth wave, more and more other components and alters were separated. And in fifth wave, Veren divorced and she just met a new partner with an important renewal of the network. Then life events really appear in the evolution of the network structure.
and we can tell more and more detailed stories about ego, alters and their relationships associated with the life transitions and events. Research tracks can be developed in different directions. Identify different ways of being a couple. Some partners remain peripheral. Some are included in the family circles, others in friends circles, and their position in the network may evolve in different ways. Thus, network composition, structure and evolution may tell a lot about the diversity of conjugal life and help understanding it as a process. It can be very interesting also to compare the effects of different life events on the network. When Samuel started to work, his group of friends of high school exploded into multiple small components and he made new friends already separated. The transition from education to the world of work involves learning about divisions and hierarchies and moving from groups of friends and mates gathered around activities towards individualized relationships as we have seen with the dynamics of relationships. At the time of the birth of her first child, Susie developed her relationships. She cited her family and her partner's family more, and she also met new friends who were also in a couple and connected to her partner's sister and her husband. The effect of the divorce on Clotilde's network is quite clear. She lost a lot of friends and even her family got angry at her. Half her friends are new friends. Her new partner still remains apart as she doesn't want to mix up everybody again. A systematic comparison of the effects of these events is being carried out with colleagues in different countries and broader data sets. But life doesn't unfold in only one dimension. We therefore deal with biographical transitions in various domains and their interferences. Let us see, for example, the case of young people who move abroad. When François goes to live in Norway, he's a student and single, which is very different from Nicola, who met Veronica in Spain and goes to live with her in Italy to work in a furniture company. For Gaël, who was already in a couple, the departure to Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean, but also his illness had an effect on the size of his network, but not on its structure which keeps the same shape. So we can identify and compare effects on network size and its composition and its structure. Homophily is an important indicator too that can testify to the existing social divides. For example, Clotilde here has most people with no child in deep blue in the graph in her network like herself. Three years after, she has a child and most of her network have to. Her old friends had children in the meanwhile too, in red, and new friends in pink mostly already had children. So how does it work? She excluded people without children in a process of selection, she made new friends who were in the same situation with her, but maybe also her friends decided to have children when they saw her example, or herself decided to have a child because most of her friends were having children. There are again several processes combined in this process. But the factor which again and again inflects all these differences and all these evolutions is the inequality of social background. In both our surveys, the size of the network grows steadily with the level of education, and this is a result found in most of the surveys. The share of the family as well as the structure are also differentiated according to social background. Inequalities are therefore quite persistent in networks also. Then we were surprised by both the diversity of personal networks and their sensitivity to context and to social and biographical dynamics. We realized that we could make many links between the evolution of the personal network and life events, whether 
predictable, like end of studies, living as a couple, or unpredictable, like illness, divorce, unemployment, and so on. We would like, therefore, to be able to generalize the identification of regularities and evolutions. And this led us, Alain, Michel, and I, to more systematic analysis and experiments on the network structure. Alain will now tell you about it. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Alain Dogen. Michel framed our work on personal networks. He showed the importance of context. Claire focused on the dynamics of relationships and structure. Our question is now, how can we summarize structural properties that reflect the overall structure of the network, rather than isolated indicators? How can we move forward with a structural description that highlights social properties that are important to us as sociologists? How can this procedure be transferable to other surveys and generalized? We then tried to make a typology of personal networks. With the Campanel, we have 306 personal networks that are comparable because they were collected with the same systematic procedure. After some attempts, we found that four variables were sufficient to obtain a satisfactory result. We built a decision tree that is based on between a centralization, modularity, Leuven method, density and diameter. Between the centralization tells us whether the members of the network are more or less massively linked to one of them, other than ego. Modularity allows separate networks according to their number of clusters. Density, when the centralization in low and modularity I, it can distinguish between networks consisting of multiple dissociated clusters from those with more isolated points or very small clusters. Diameter allows to identify networks that have long relational chains. We have sought to make this typology applicable to other data. This is why we choose thresholds in terms of percentiles of the distribution and not in absolute values. We obtain a typology in six classes, which can be illustrated by real typical networks. Regular dance, a network in which different contexts are shared with everybody, typically a young person living at parents' home. Centered dance, one of few alters have a higher betweenness, parents, older brother, partner. Hunter star. Contexts are more separated except with partner. Typically a couple with dissociated clusters. Segmented. Contexts from clusters and nobody crosses them. Single people with different life contexts. Percola, some different bridges are connecting different parts in case of migration or divorce. Dispersed, more isolated alters, perhaps a single migrant or person enduring hardship. For example, we can then see how this distribution in types evolves with the survey waves. This table illustrates the variations in the shape of the networks along the survey waves in this period of entry into adult life of the respondents. In the first two waves, the respondents are still students. Few are in couples. The networks are dense, 
because most of them live at their parents' home. In wave three and four, partnering increases the number of centered networks. In the ways following entry in the labor market, networks become generally more dissociated and specialized by context, and later, moving and sometimes divorce, increase the number of segmented and dispersed networks. As people become adults along the survey waves, the median of the density and their network decreases. We collaborated with Telecom Paritex researchers, Christophe Prieur and Raphael Charbet, who worked on personal network from Facebook in a project called Algopal. Through this collaboration and after a selection of their network of a similar size with ours, we can find our tips as shown here. But the classification does not yet give the same results because of the greater presence of centralized networks in our data. This is due to the fact that life as a couple is more distinctive for offline networks than for online networks. We are now working with them on networks from which we removed what we have called alter egos. That is, alters that are connected to almost all the others. This gave us a new idea. Having seen the interest of removing the alter egos to highlight less visible aspects of the network, we decided to remove progressively the most central alters. For this purpose, we implemented a recalculated betweenness algorithm. The recalculated betweenness algorithm with vertex suppression is well known. It is used in particular by researchers interested in attack against communication networks, as it allows to identify nested intermediaries. Let us show our process on the example of Varen's network in 1995 the first wave of the Campanel. Here is the entire network of Velen. She is on the left of the graph in gray. The vertices represented by squares are those which the algorithm will make appear as intermediaries. Chantal is Velen Moza. Nathalie, her sister. Gail is her partner. Janine is her godmother. Melanie is her best friend since childhood. All others are friends. In descending order, the strongest betweenness centralities are Varen, Gaël, Melanie, Chantal, Nathalie, and Emily. We have removed Varen. The order of betweenness has changed. Chantal and Nathalie are now before Gaël and Melanie. By removing Varen, we also changed the betweenness of all the alters, since she is connected to all of them. But this betweenness has changed unevenly once Varen was removed. Chantal and Nathalie became mandatory relays between the family and the neighbors. They have thus gained in betweenness more so than Gail and Melanie. Now Chantal and Nathalie have been removed. It's now Gael who has the highest degree of centrality. Gael has been removed. Melanie is removed. The process will continue. Emily, Nathalie, Sabrina, Olivier, and finally Carla and Bruno will be retired successively. Now only a collection of cliques and isolated individuals remain. All betweenness centralities are equal to zero. The process stops naturally. We can represent this algorithm in the form of a tree. The removed vertices, the intermediaries, form the, the axis of the tree. At each intermediary, we associate the cliques isolated or dyads, 
which were disconnected and whose betweenness became equal to zero. Because of the tree shape of the graph, we call them leaves. They are represented by circles. The deconstruction trees appear as a highlight of the respective roles of the alters in the network. It highlights local intermediaries, that is to say vertices in smaller components with maximum local betweenness. They allow to follow the evolution of these roles over time. I will present now the evolution of the Florence network through the five waves of the panel. This is the network of Florence in 1995 and the corresponding deconstruction tree. She is still in high school and lives at her parents' home. Then her family and friends are interconnected in a relatively dense network. First of all, the social rules can explain the betweenness. The elder sister Karin is an intermediary between the parents' home, Patrick and Liz, and the friends she agrees to share with Florence. The partner Thomas comes next. Miriam is the nanny's daughter, so she has gone through all the stages of Florence's life and therefore knows all her family. Thus, the duration of the relationship plays an important part in betweenness because all the ties have been associated to different successive contexts. Moreover, Miriam also shares a lot of different contexts with Florence nowadays. She meets her at school. In the neighborhood, she plays theater with her and Vincent and Thomas, and Miriam gave important support. Henriette is Florence's grandmother. We are in 1998. Now, her partner Thomas and her friend Miriam have passed ahead of the sisters and parents in the deconstruction. They have become the main intermediaries. The family becomes next. Denise is a former friend of Karin, her elder sister. Thomas is the partner. So he crosses these two spheres and passes ahead of the mother leads. Thus, older ties between alters can be relevant for, for betweenness. Thomas is no longer her partner, but his betweenness still appears in the deconstruction. Karin, then, is the first intermediary in a network that has changed and lost in density. Her new partner is Bertrand, whom she met through Thomas, which explains their proximity in the graph. Thus, former ties between ego and alter can explain this alter's betweenness. Her parents have divorced and her father has lost in betweenness compared to her mother. The network is less dense and less centralized now. It takes a polar shape with different central alters connecting different parts of the network. Florence has separated for one year from Bertrand and now they started again. Bertrand and Karine are ex -echo now. But who is Sun, who appears and catches the first trunk of betweenness? Sam is an old friend of former partner Thomas, and also a friend of Bertrand. He was even the first witness to Florence's transition from one partner to the other. He became a strong tie to Florence because he was her only friend who came to visit her in the city where she had found a job. They also jogged together, went through hardship together, and 
now they share confidences. Sam's betweenness thus comes from both the sharing of past and present contexts, from prisons during transition and from the older ties between him and other Altes, especially the two partners, Thomas and Bertrand. Florence's parents are now marginal in the network. It is now 2015. Florence has much more isolated friends who disappeared with her removal. Bertrand, his partner and her, two sisters, Karine and Audrey, as well as Miriam, her childhood friend, now appear as the only intermediaries. Her network has concentrated on its historical core. The rank in the process is an interesting indicator in the personal network. People who remove the intermediaries play an intermediary role between the alters. They are mostly relatives. We can see precisely with this example some of the factors favoring betweenness. The social role, parents, partner. The duration of the relationship and the life stage is crossed, but also the anteriority of the relationships between the alters and the diversity of past and present context shared. It also testifies that the network is the product of the history of ego and his or her relationships. Intermediaries keep track of the role they had or still have. The rank in the deconstruction, which is recorded to each, for each alter, allows the comparison of alters to be generalized. This graph is built on all the 306 networks. It represents the relationship between the nature of alters link with ego and the rank at which they appear in the deconstruction. Rank 1 is ego. The partner most often appears in rank 2. The family is in the middle ranks uh, as are some people outside of the family. Here we have the evolution of the density, modularity and betweenness of ego over time. On all networks, the median of the density decreases over time, as we have seen us at slides five, while the median of the modularity and of the betweenness centrality of ego increases. This suggests that as people settle into adulthood, they think less their network in terms of groups and more in terms of personal ties between individuals or between couples. On the basis of our analysis, another hypothesis can be formulated. In the course of time, with the events of life, the place of the family in the network, the intermediary role of the parents, of the brothers and sisters shifts. They become less central. The deconstruction provides information on the role of Valters in the network. The rank in the deconstruction and the variations of this rank over time and across contexts says how many steps it took to completely deconstruct the network. It allows to compare the network with other networks. It allows, it also informs about the circles and contexts that make up the network. The number of the deconstruction steps is an indicator of the complexity of the network. As a conclusion, the networks that relationship weave around people have a structure that say a lot about people and their life courses. There is still much room for improvement 
In the analysis of these structures, we have presented some avenues for doing so, in particular by deconstructing networks. More generally, the study of personal networks is a powerful tool to understanding more general developments in the social world. Studying personal networks is therefore essential for understanding the evolution of contemporary societies. This can be done in each country, but also through international comparison, since variation in the characteristics of personal networks remain sufficiently limited to allow meaningful comparisons. We have also seen that the analysis of personal networks also poses significant methodological challenges, provided that the structure is sufficiently documented. In short, we have not finished studying personal networks. Thank you.